Hey, welcome everybody joining us online and those joining us in the chapel this morning. It is an honor for us today to uh, have a special guest. He's not only here today, but he's here through this week, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, each night 6.30, but tonight at 6. But we, we are honored to have Choco De Jesus. Pastor Choco is uh, originally from Chicago. He serves as the uh, general treasurer for the Sons of God in Springfield, Missouri. And we are honored to have him here with us this week. And he'll tell you a little bit more about himself through the week, but I want you to give the biggest New Hope welcome to Pastor Choco de Jesus as he comes to bring us the word this morning. Well, good morning. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord and our Savior. He's our Redeemer. He's not dead. I spoke to him this morning. And he wants me to tell you that he loves you. He loves you. And this is your first time coming to our church here at New Hope. Welcome. Be rooted. Stop looking. This is a great church, great people, great vision. So thank you, Pastor Jeff. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you for the introduction. Uh, Just uh, the entire staff for what you guys are doing here in Urbandale, Iowa. And those that are at the chapel, I bless you in Jesus' name. Those that have tuned in online and um, are watching this, we're excited to have you. I'm excited to be here. I was trying to figure out if this is the longest time I've ever been at a place. Well, I'm here today, tonight, at uh, 6 6 p.m., and then tomorrow, and then Tuesday and Wednesday. By Wednesday, you guys would be like, when is he leaving? <laughs> or do we just take his membership? <laughs> but what a joy, I've been praying for you all. Been praying for this event, been praying for this weekend. I've invited some Hispanic churches. I'm inviting you to come tonight. Don't stay watching NFL. Right. There's nothing that they can do for you, amen. Come on, get to church, amen. So we're, we're excited, and I'm here with my wife. Let me show you a picture of my wife. Uh, uh, this is my wife, Elizabeth. When she was 12 years old, I was 14. I asked her how to be my girlfriend, true story. We were in church, we didn't, get, we didn't start dating until she was 17 and I was 19. We've been married for 34 years to the glory of God, and uh, we pastored a church, amen. <laughs> we pastored a church in Chicago for 19 years. Her father was the former pastor for 35 years. And I pastored a church for 19 years in the hood of Chicago. Elizabeth and I have three beautiful children. Let me show you my kids, my tribe. This is my tribe. Uh, My three kids are married and they're out of the house. Glory to God. Come on, somebody. I'm not this Hispanic father that wants their kids to stay with them. No, no, you got to go. You got to go. I want my girlfriend back. Amen. Elizabeth and I, we are grandparents. Let me show you a picture of my grandchildren. How many grandparents we have in the audience? Any grandparents? It's a beautiful ministry. I keep saying all over America, God should have given us the grandchildren first and kept the kids. Amen. But this is Charlie Grace. She's the oldest one. During 2020, during the riots in Chicago, Charlie was feeding police officers. Because I've always taught my children we must engage culture. We cannot be afraid of culture. We must engage it with the truth and love of the gospel. So this is Charlie Grace, this is Reagan Liv, the second one, she's our oldest, the second oldest granddaughter. Pray for me, because Reagan and her brother Dono, or Donnie, are white, and they're like, have blue eyes. Uh, I, I'm brown with brown eyes. So I told my daughter, if I ever go to Walmart, or Target with these kids, I need their birth certificate, don't play. <laughs> I don't want anybody to think I stole these kids. So this is my second oldest, uh, Reagan, and then James Anthony, he's gonna be a piano player, a golfer like his daddy, Dono. He's gonna be a mountain climber, loves to climb. And Alea Sky just turned uh, two years old, and so now we're expecting our sixth one in December. So I show you my picture, so when you think about Pastor Choco, you uh, can pray for my tribe, amen? And so we're, we're excited to be here and be a part of your church these next few days. Do not miss, you never know what can happen. 
Thomas found that out. When he came and the disciples told him, he was here. No, he wasn't, because he missed. So you never want to never wanna miss if you can. Get to church tonight. I have an illustrated sermon for you. If you've never seen an illustrated sermon, I'm going to do one for you all here in New Hope. Amen? Hey, uh, would you, if you're physically able to stand for the reading of God's word, would you stand? I'm old-fashioned like that. If you're physically able to stand here in the chapel, Mark chapter 12 is where I'm at. I want to bring you a word today from my new book called Love Them Anyway. And right after the service, I'll be in the lobby area, and, and I, uh, four, I've got five books, and I brought four out of five of them. But today, I'm going to be preaching out of the, my newest book called Love Them Anyway, which I think answers the prevailing question in America. What do we do with this craziness that's happening in our culture? What do we do, Pastor Choco, with this racial tension and the political unrest? We love them. And when I say we love them, hear me out this morning. When I say we love them, it doesn't mean that we should capitulate our convictions. I would never surrender my convictions. When I say love them, I say we should affirm their humanity, not affirm their lifestyle. The church of Jesus Christ is the greatest institution on planet Earth. I told the New York Times when they asked me about this cancel culture, they said, hey, what do you think about this cancel culture? And I looked into the camera and I said, tell cancel culture this, you cannot cancel what you did not create. And you did not create the church of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells me not even the gates of hell will prevail against his church. It's a good place to say amen. amen. I told the New York Times that for 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ and culture have always been at odds. And that the church was never called to accommodate culture. It was called to speak into culture Amen. prophetically. Amen? Amen? So let's do that this morning. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them, disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O new hope. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your, and with all your, and with all your, and with all your, that's right. So you're, you're all in, in 2022, you're all in with Jesus. Regardless of the craziness in the culture, there is no ambiguity in you serving Christ. Verse 31 says this, the second is this, you shall love your, OMG, you shall love me and I shall love you. You have a Puerto Rican brother, don't know if you know that. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for those that are here in the chapel, those that are watching online. Have your way. Mess us up. We didn't come to church to leave the same way. Provoke our spirits. Disturb us. Speak to us. In Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. amen. You may be seated. Love. Love demands more of you and me than we often want to give. It is easy, let's be honest this morning, it is easy to love a lovable person. But what about them? What about that stereotype, that race, that person, or that group of people in a political party or culture or social class who don't behave like you, don't believe like you, don't act like you? What about them? What about your brother? What about your mom? What about your uncle? What about those who offended you? Those who backstabbed you? What about those who abandoned you? What about them? Let me see a show of hands here. How many of you all here this morning, and those that are watching in the chapel, you've never heard of me before? Raise your hand. You've never heard, oh, the entire church. Father, forgive them. 
According to sociologists, I am a status inconsistency. I should not be here in Urbandale, Iowa, preaching to you all. I should not be the general treasurer of the Assemblies of God USA. I should not be pastor. I should be dead in Chicago. I should be in prison in Chicago, but God. God is in the business of using unusual people. The Bible's filled with unusual folks that God used. You see, I was abandoned at the age of eight years old at a bar. My father abandoned my mother. Since you don't know who I am, I got to give you backdrop. My father abandoned my mother with six children in the city of Chicago. I am the youngest of six. I am like Gideon, the youngest of my tribe. And I remember going to the bar at the age of eight years old, pleading to my dad not to leave my mother in one of the worst parks in the United States, Humble Park was declared the worst park in the United States in the 1970s. During the 1970s, there was a riot that broke out between the Puerto Ricans and the police department because a police officer, a white police officer, shot two Puerto Ricans in the back and killed them. And that created a riot that galvanized all the gangs, the Hispanic gangs in the city of Chicago. That's where I lived with no father, no Jesus, destined for destruction for sure. My brother was a leader of a gang in Chicago. And I remember, I remember, and I'm going to fast forward because of time. I remember they were, they were breaking into stores. Paddy wagons were upside down. And they were on fire. You get it. Whatever you saw in 2020, I lived it in the city of Chicago. And I remember they were going into the stores. They broke the windows, and they started stealing cases of goods and groceries. They started stealing and so forth. And I was watching all this happen unfold and I said to myself, I'm going to go into the store and I'm going to steal me a bottle of Coca-Cola. So come with me into the store. I started walking towards the store. The windows were shattered. And if you have an imagination, use it. People are running back and forth with cases stealing. And I remember going to the refrigerator of the store, opening up the refrigerator, grabbing the bottle of Coca-Cola, closed the refrigerator. I may be a thief but I have a conscience of energy. Close the refrigerator. My mother taught me well, boy, close the refrigerator. I closed the refrigerator. I walked back down with a bottle of Coca-Cola and I walked onto Division Street. Division Street in the city of Chicago is the main artery of the Puerto Rican community. And I heard a voice that said, put it back. Not today at 58, I know it's the Holy Spirit. But back then I didn't know what it was. Put it back. Went back into the store, <laughs> walked over the threshold, opened the refrigerator, put the bottle of Coca-Cola, closed the refrigerator, went back onto the vision street. I remember thinking, who am I? I mean, these people are stealing cases. I can't even steal a bottle. <laughs> it reminds me of the letters of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the 1945, April 9th, was killed by the Germans, and he wrote a prison letters, who am I? That's how I felt. Fast forward a little bit, a few years later, the mayor, Mayor Belandic of the city of Chicago, gave the Puerto Rican community over $400,000 of a grant to hire young people to clean the streets of Chicago. I was one of them. And my assignment led me to a church, 1665 North Mozart. It was an AG church, Assemblies of God Church, Palestine Christian Temple of the Assemblies of God. I walked up on a Monday, 1665, Palestine Christian Temple, the Assemblies of God. These are Palestinians. <laughs> I walked in, I told the supervisor, I said, my name is Rofredo de Jesus, and I'm here to clean streets. He says, oh, you're not going to clean streets. You're going to do VBS. I said, VB what? <laughs> Vocational Bible School. He says, you're going to work with children. I said, do I get a check? Because my mother's a single mom, I want to help her out. He says, you're going to get paid. Every day of that summer of 1977, the young people were at the altar. They were praying, they were praying. And that began to resonate with me because these were 15-year-olds and 17-year-olds on their knees. Now, I, was, I was unchurch. I did not know Jesus. In August of 1977, how many know that curiosity killed the... That's right. So I go to the supervisor and say, what are these people doing? He says, well, Fredo, they, they're praying to Jesus. Do you know Jesus? 
I said, I don't. He said, would you like to meet him? I said, I would. Where is he at? I want to talk to him. The young people got in a circle. The supervisor called them. And then he looked at me and says, Alfredo, get in the middle of the circle. I said, no. <laughs> Let me help you out here in Urbandale, Iowa, in the hood. You never get in the middle of anything. This is called a beatdown. Trying to help you out. I said, no. The young people started praying. I felt something happen to me. Fast forward, I started attending that church. I accepted Jesus Christ. I didn't know what I was doing. I was 14 years old. I started going to that local church, AG Church. It was November of that year of 1977, and the youth pastor comes to me and says, Choco, we're going to Lansing, Michigan for our youth convention. Why don't you come with us? I get in the church van. We head towards Lansing, Michigan. The preacher's preaching in a hotel. He makes an altar call. I come to the altar again. I want to tell you this morning, I got saved many times in my life. Every time there was an altar call, I wanted to be at the altar. And so I was kneeling down. An old lady comes, and she puts her hands on my shoulder and begins to speak in tongues. It's not Spanish, because I'm Puerto Rican. I know Spanish. And then she prophesied. She said these words to me. I've called you to be a great leader. Stay in my path. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Now today at 58, I know that's the covenant that God made with Abraham. But at 14, I'm thinking, this is pretty cool. I don't know who this lady is. I got up out of the altar 10 minutes later. I went into the elevator of the hotel thinking about what the lady said. And when I get into the elevator, the doors were about to close, and a gentleman walks in in a suit. And the doors close, y'all. Boom. And he turns towards me and he said these words to me. Have you not heard? I've called you to be a great leader. Stay in my path. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. Now I'm thinking it's the husband of the lady that was at the altar. I'm not sure. <laughs> but this is freaking me out. Little did I know, y'all, that God was marking me. What God was saying to me at 14, Choco, although your father abandoned you, although your mother doesn't have a plan for you, I, the Lord of the universe, I have a plan for you. Stay in these parameters. I started going to that church with that mandate. Fast forward, in the next service, I'll spend a little more time. My wife and I, now is the year 2000, in that same circle, of 1977, in that same circle where those young people prayed, now I'm kneeling down, being anointed as the pastor of that local church that I was sent to in 1977. The provisions of God. I started pastoring their church in Chicago, y'all, and since I wasn't raised in the church, and I knew that this gospel that you and I believe cannot be within these four walls, they must go outside. We cannot keep it. People need to hear about the love of Jesus. America does not have a hem problem. America does not have a head problem. They have a heart problem. There needs to be a metamorphosis. And only Jesus Christ can change the heart of a human. I've been preaching that, telling people. And so I started throwing the net, y'all, in Chicago. I started bringing in blackfish, whitefish, Asian fish, gay fish, straight fish. I brought them in because my father loves them. Even in their mess, he loves you. I started bringing in that church, started growing from one service to two services to three, 17 services on a Sunday to the glory of God. Because my father loved me. I remember one time where the police commander came to me and he said, Reverend, we have a problem. I said, what's your problem? He said, we've arrested 600 women for prostitution in nine months. I said, Commander, you have a problem. <laughs> he says, is there anything your church can do? I said, we'll pray for you. Now, how many believe in the power of prayer here this morning? I believe in the power of prayer, but I also believe, church, that with revelation, look at me, with revelation comes responsibility. When God reveals to New Hope the condition of Urbandale, Iowa, yes, we should pray, but we should act. Because you're learning that with revelation comes responsibility. So I called one of my female pastors to my office, and I said to her, 
I need you to go find me five prostitutes. She said, come again? <laughs> I said, I want you to go find me five women and ask them how much they would charge me for one hour of service. And she's like, Pastor Choco. I said, go, go do it. She goes, comes back two and a half hours later. She comes back with five women, mini skirts, they're drugged up, African-American, Hispanic, messed up. They get out of their car. The female pastor comes to me and said, no, Pastor Chuka, the tall one's gonna charge you $50 an hour. The one next to her is 35, the other one's 40. $225 for all five women. I said, no problem. So I go to the women. I started giving them money, and one of the ladies says, what do you want us to do? I said, I want you to follow me, please. And I take them inside the church, y'all. And inside the church, I prepared a banquet with roses and candles. And I remember taking out the chair one by one, and I said, please sit. Please sit. I have you for one hour. I'm going to tell you about a man named Jesus who loves you dearly. You were not born a prostitute. And he loves you even in your mess. And for one hour, my wife led worship. The young people of the local church did drama. And I preached about the love of God that not even Rahab in the Bible was born a prostitute. That we must do something to rescue these girls. And then when my time was up, I said, ladies, I'm sorry. I only paid you for one hour. They were crying, stood up profusely. And they said, preacher, no man has ever treated us this way. Here's your money back, we don't want your money. Today, some of those women are elders and deacons of our church in Chicago. <laughs> love compels us. What is love in Mark 12? What is love in this context? We read that Jesus broke boundaries to love the people that many despised. Hear me out this morning. His love transforms people. His love saw past disagreements, indifferences, offenses, loving them like this. It's hard, Pastor Choker. You have no idea what she did to me. The greatest desire of mankind is to love and to be loved. Did you hear me? Love is from God because God is love. The Old Testament develops and amplifies these two points, love for God and love for each other. Have you ever noticed the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments, the first four is dealing love for God. And the next six is loving each other. Come on now, come on now. Don't, don't kid yourself. It wasn't the nails that held Jesus on the cross. Come on. It was his love for you and for you and for you and for you that are watching. It was his love for you and me. When I was, I was swimming in a pool of blood and I was messed up in Chicago, he loved me. He gave us his love. The greatest commandment, Mark 12, Jesus is confronted by an expert of the law who asked him, which is the greatest commandment? Watch this. And Jesus answers by giving him not one, but two commandments love the lord your god with all your heart your mind your soul and your strength and love your neighbor as yourself god is love he says in jeremiah 31 3 he says i have loved you with everlasting love therefore i've continued my faithfulness towards you everything church new hope everything God has done from Gen genesis to the book of revelation it was it was born out of love and he says in 1 John 4, 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. You say, well, Pastor Choker, why would you say that? I don't say that. The Bible says that. Whoever does not love does not know God. You're learning this morning that love, hear me out, love is the currency of heaven. Love is the currency, and, and you need to withdraw from that bank because your love and my love is perverted. Your love and my love is conditional, but his love is unconditional. Are you with me this morning? Love is the currency of heaven, and because of this, love is the great commodity of the kingdom of God. And I got news for you this morning. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. 
When I put this down, I thought for sure everybody's gonna say amen. I'm gonna say it again, everybody say amen. I got news for you all, we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Don't mistake this. Yes, you live in Iowa. Yes, you live in the country of the United States, but the moment you came to Jesus Christ, you and I are now citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors of his love. We are, look at me, look at me. We are conduits, not cul-de-sacs, of his love to a confused world. And a confused world needs a fearless church Amen. that I will love you regardless. And I've been telling people across America that I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. And my father loves you and there's nothing you can do about that. Are you with me? Woo. Love begins with God. We love in two different ways. Watch this, because of love, and in spite of, let's deal with this one really quickly. Because you got money, I love you. Because you keep me in the house, I love you. Because you have a nice car, I love you. That's because of. In spite of love says this, in spite of the fact that you diss me, I still love you. In spite of the fact that you backstab me, I still love you. In spite of the fact that you can never pay me back, I still love you. I remember, I remember my son, every, you know, Pastor's children are not born with halos. My kids are like your kids, they're knuckleheads. But one day the Holy Spirit woke me up around 11 o'clock in the night, go look at the car. I went to the garage, looked at the car, sure enough, marijuana, drugs. Well, can you imagine a father? I'm broken. We don't do this in this house, we don't even drink, we don't do none of that. I took the drug stuff and I went upstairs to the room and I woke, I woke him up around 11.30 now in the night, and his name is Pito. You saw him in the picture. I said, Pito, what's up with this? And like any teenage boy, he said, it's not mine. It's my friend. I said, Pito, the Holy Spirit told me it's yours. And if the Holy Spirit told me it's yours, you're dead in the water. I said, look at me, boy. Look at me. You hear me, son? You have no idea what you've done to your father and your mother, I will knock on heaven's door on your behalf. And I'll keep knocking on heaven's door until God gets this out of your system. Because you were born with destiny. I said, look at me, Pito. Nothing you do, son, nothing you do can make me love you more or less. But you are in control how pleased I am with you. And I'm not pleased with you. Well, praise the Lord, he's 27, going on his second child, loves God, serves the Lord. But he was my them. What do you do? You love them. When we started rescuing prostitutes, we ended up buying a farm. I'll share a little bit more about it at the second service, but we ended up buying a farm three hours from Chicago in Cambridge, Illinois, and, uh, and we started rescuing women on Friday nights. Our women from the church would go on a church van and they would go by the strip joints in the motels and they would go out there, my wife included, she would be out there and they would see women in the corners with their pimps and we would give them roses and on the, on the roses on the stem, there would be a card that says, if you wanna be rescued, there's a van around the corner. And we would get women, take them in the van and take them to Cambridge, Illinois. One lady got in the van, took the three hour drive to Cambridge, Illinois, gets to the farm, it's 15 acres, cornfields. She's a little bit high. She gets off the van and says, okay, I made a mistake. I gotta find a way back to Chicago. So she started walking around the 15 acres and she went to one of the barns and she saw 10 speed bikes. And she began to put a plan together and she says, I'm gonna stick them, I'm gonna head back tomorrow morning at six o'clock when everybody's sleeping. She goes back into the dorms, tells one of the ladies her plan. That lady got up and went to go tell the pastor. His name is Pastor Rico. And Pastor Rico says, don't worry about it, I got it. He gets up around midnight, Pastor Rico, and he goes to the barn and he opens the door and he says, 
Six o'clock in the morning, she comes to the barn, opens the door, and she realizes that the air has been taken out of the tire. And she told my wife years later, she tells my wife years later, I have never felt so loved in my life that someone would love me enough. She graduated from the farm. She stood in the farm for a year. Her daughter, who was out there in the streets living that life, she gets saved, her daughter. She goes through our program called Master's Commission. She goes there for three years and she gets her credentials. And then we send her out to Camden, New Jersey, the worst city in the United States, Camden, New Jersey. And she opens up, we open up a campus because I always wanted to be where is the worst. And she's there, and we begin to minister to people. I would fly from Chicago, do my five services, and on a Tuesday morning, I would be preaching to nine people in a storefront, because my father loves them. And there's a cost for reconciliation. Someone has to pay so that others will be reconciled. Are you with me this morning? I know it's uncomfortable to love people, seldom used these days to love people, to love your enemy. I've been saying across this country that that's what we need is our church, to love folks who have hurt you. You see, my father abandoned me when I was eight years old, I told you that. I was destined for destruction, had no future. But a few years ago, before I went to Springfield, Missouri, I was still pastoring the church in Chicago and we had a family meeting, my siblings and I, and they tell me in this meeting that my father, who lives in New Jersey, they're about to amputate his legs. He's in his 88 years old. They're about to amputate his legs. And there's different feelings in this room. You get the idea. This man abandoned all of us. There's different feelings. Leave him there, whatever. Let him just burn in hell. Some don't know Jesus. You know what I'm talking about. I said, oh, oh, here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll buy him his ticket, and I'll fly him to Chicago, to Chicago O'Hare. I'll bring him here, and I'll bring him to my house. So we flew him from New Jersey to Chicago. I picked him up, and I take him to my house. My wife is cooking meal for us, and I remember beginning to take off his clothes to clean the wounds of this man who abandoned me at eight years old at a bar. You think I would have one or two questions for this man. Why did you leave my mom? Why did you do that? I had zero questions. None. At this point, I'm a man. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. But I do want this man to know Jesus. My heavenly father. He was my them. Loved them anyway. And I began to clean his wounds. I wanted him to see Jesus, not Choco, Jesus, in spite of, of what he did to us. Well, he lasted a year in the city. His leg got healed. His leg gets healed. He lives with us. He lives with my sister. We sent him back to New Jersey because that's where he wants to be. And a few weeks later, someone sent me a picture. I want to show you this picture of my father. Go ahead and put up that picture. This is him, he's now 93. He's never been in a church. His church was the bar. Until his son showed him love, my father's love. And I've come from Speak for Missouri to mess you up, to tell you, let it go, let it go. Love them. Pastor Choco, you don't know what she did. I understand. But love them. How would they know that your father lives with you? Would you stand with me this morning? Those that are at the chapel, would you stand as well? God commands us to love. To love him and to love others. <coughs> Romans 5.5 5 says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.14, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. 
Not only that God commands you and I, but he equips us through the Holy Spirit. Who? Who is the them in your life this morning that you need to forgive? You need to let go. With every head bowed and every eyes closed all over this sanctuary, I don't know how many of you here at the sound of my voice would say, Pastor Choco, uh, this sermon was for me. I needed to hear this. I haven't spoken to my sibling in a year, five years. It's been a while. And I realize I must pay so that we can be reconciled. Pray for me that God would give me the strength to love them. Pray for me. If that's you here at the sound of my voice, I want you to lift your hands quickly. I want to pray for you. Hands are going up, hands are going up. Who else? Pray for me. I'm not asking you to join my church. I'm asking you, what are you going to do with this love? My father loves you. I need help to love. I have a son, I have a daughter. He's my them. Hands are going up. Who else? Keep your hands up. I'm going to pray. And with pastor's permission, if you raise your hand, I believe in altar time, if you raise your hand, I want you to get out of your seat and meet me up here quickly. Do that. Even at the chapel, I want you to do that quickly. I give you 30 seconds to get out of your seat. Don't let fear paralyze you. Get out of your seat quickly and come. He loves you. He loves you. Everyone has a them. Everyone has a them. I'll wait for you, 20 seconds. Pastor Choco, I need Jesus in my life. I've backslid, I've walked away from the church. I need Jesus, pray for me. If that's you, I want you to get out of your seat, come, come. My father loves you, he loves you. Love them anyway. And here's what we're gonna do, church, as we begin to worship, I'm gonna ask the ministers of the church and Pastors, come on, let's just pray for our brothers and sisters here in the sanctuary. Church, would you extend your hands forward? Would you begin to pray for these, your brothers and your sisters that are here as we begin to worship? Come, he loves you. Let's pray. Let it go. Let it go. Prayer warriors, would you come? Come. Let's just lay hands on our brothers and pray with them, prayer warriors all over, those in the chapel, come. Let's pray. Don't let them be by themselves, you come.